One small group, the African Blood Brotherhood, provided an early version of revolutionary self-defense program favored by militants today. The Brotherhood was a the first left-wing black nationalist organization and one of the first organizations to consider a separate black republic in the southern United States. Information on the Brotherhood is hard to come by since so much of its activity was convert. However, the Brotherhood did admit its role in the Tulsa riot of 1921. This is the last of many white mob invasions in the black community which followed World War I. It began routinely enough as a black man was arrested for bothering a white woman in an elevator. The arrest occurred in an immense intense climate. The local ABA had announced a few weeks earlier that it would stop any attempts at lynching in Tulsa with physical force if necessary. The threat was not idle one. The ABA Monthly, the Crusader, often discussed the necessity of using force to get our rights. ABA branches held a weekly calisthenics club session. The Brotherhood, the, the Crusader reported, worked hard and fast to protect Negroes at Tulsa when they first saw the war clouds gathering over that Oklahoma City. Shortly after the arrest of the man in the elevator, a contingent of armed blacks fronted, formed in front of the jail where they met a gang of whites apparently bent on lynching. One man tried to take the gun, the one black's gun from him. and In ensuing scuffle, the white was shot and a riot was on. Blacks made an orderly retreat and established a defensive position around the railroad tracks which separated the races in Tulsa and reports really repeated right charges. The governor of Oklahoma then called out the National Guard and reportedly to stop the riot. The guardsmen entered the black neighborhood during the truce and in his Irish residence and then withdraw so the white mosque could return. A private plane hired, by, hired to drop dynamite bombs on the black neighborhood. Robert Abbott of the Defender eager for good Dixie atrocity photographs, outdid himself on the Tulsa riots. His newspaper carried two large photos showing entire neighborhoods leveled by aerial bomb bombing and ground fire. There's some consolidation in this riot. The black defense act action was to bear fruit in other black communities. White mobs never again attempted to evade a major black neighborhood, except in Detroit during World War II. Governor officials accused the Black African Brotherhood of playing a leading role in the defense of the black neighborhoods. The ABA later admitted to this and went on to use the action to attract members. One fundraising advertisement in November 1921, Crusader stated, As we have done by you, do you by us. Remember Tulsa. Remember the bright, untarnished record of the ABA, of the ABB. What other organization can match that brave record? Tulsa was one of many ABB branches spotted haphazardly across the United States. The largest membership was in New York, the home office, but there were sizable contingencies in Chicago, Baltimore, Oklahoma, and West Virginia. One of the most recurring recruiting was done through the um, Crusader. The head of the West Virginia ABB was a Mr. White and had been attracted to ABB when he was shown a copy by a soldier who had returned from Europe via New York. White is significantly enthused to walk all the way to New York and to arrange to become a Brotherhood official. The ABB also established groups in the Caribbean area, in Trinidad, Suriname, British Guyana, and Santo Domingo in the Windward Islands. At its height, the ABA only had about three to 5,000 members, most of them ex-servicemen, though a sizable contingent of immigrants from the West Indies also joined. The numbers were kept small, in part by design, but the possibilities of danger. In the Brotherhood, militarily and nationally, and the left-wing ideology undoubtedly alienated and confused some folks. The ABB saw itself as a tight-knit, semi clandestine paramilitary group with the hope of acting for a worldwide federation for black organizations. The Brotherhood official program stated, in part, in order to build a strong and effective movement on the platform of liberation for Negro people, the protection of rights, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to tech, all organizations should get all Negro organizations get together on a federal relation better basis, thus creating a united centralized movement. In the United States, according to the ABB program, such a program movement can exist openly in the North, but had to work secretly in the South to forestall premature attack. With this federation, a secret protective organization was planned, which would admit only the best and the most courageous of the race. This inner organization was to function as under strict military discipline, ready to act at a moment notice, and whenever defense and, and protections are necessary. In colonialized Africa, the ABB agents would rally Africans in the hinterland to a great pan-African army, which eventually descended upon the colonial plantations of the coastal areas. In the United States, 
the Brotherhood would have black people consolidate all business ventures into large cooperatives. And proposed federation will likely will likely every big organization develop certain properties in the shape of buildings, farms, and etc. But these will be cooperative properties for all members of the organization and administered by members elected for the purpose. Under no circumstances should a property be operated under corporation titles and rent over to a few individuals. It was acknowledged that building a powerful federation will take time. The ABB program noted, until the Negroes control rich natural resources of some countries of its own, he cannot hope to compete in industry. With the great financial magnets of the capitalist nations on a large scale enough to supply jobs for any number of Negro workers. In the end term, the only effective way to consider secure better conditions and steady employment in America was to organize the Negro labor power into labor unions. The program had an optimistic tone. The homegrown governments of the plantation capitalists are weakening day by day and trembling under menace of the proletarian revolution. The oppressed colonies and the small nations are consistent rebellion, as witness the Irish, the Turks, the Persians, the Indians, the Arabs, Egyptians, etc. For rank and file members, the, blood, the Brotherhood Recruitment advertised offer protection, economic, educational, physical, and social benefits with sick and deaf benefit department, cooperative business industrial units, as well as calisthenic clubs. The Brotherhood program and the creation of the organization itself in the spring of 1919 was the work of Cheryl Briggs. Briggs, who came from St. Kitts, was an important member of the Communist Party in the late 1920s. Unlike black leftists who hold strong ties to whites, he entered the political struggle as an iron opponent of the race first philosophy. In 1912, the 23 year old immigrant Briggs became a reporter on the New York Amsterdam, and it was two years he became the editor of the paper. In 1915, he began Cultural and Business Monthly, the Colored Review, which displayed an iron stride of race consciousness and gave no hints of his future left wing attitude. The review was the first issue shy that blacks were not patronizing their own enterprise. The lead article in the second issue urged Harlem businesses to boy use economic boycott. Briggs admitted that there was too many old white businesses to make a total boycott feasible on the call so-called Harlem Nights to discriminate against white shop owners who would not hire blacks and against those who think the hood winked the race by employing in minor positions a solitary colored man or even times in investing in what is not commonly known as the figurehead. The article included a list of white establishments which hired black and a long list of black-owned Harlem businesses. When Briggs began to display his national opinions, nationalist opinions in the Amsterdam News, the published demand that he censor his own writings. Briggs refused, and on October 17, 1917, under the glaring front page headline, Security for the Life Proposed and Serve, Why Not for Colored Nation, Briggs noted that President Wilson called for the self-determination of oppressed white national minorities, but said nothing in the counties of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The editorial cost Briggs his job because of the hopeless speech impediment that he could not return to the street corner. So in November 1918, with the help of Anthony Crawford, a black Wall Street shipbroker, Briggs started a monthly magazine, The Crusader, which soon became the official organ of the new African Blood Brotherhood. Briggs had very light complexion, which, as his writing, including his autobiography, Left Unfinished at His Death in 1966, indicated concerned him so deeply that he had tried to compensate by becoming super black. Certainly, the crusader was filled with strong sentiment statements on the virtue of blackness. Taken as a whole, the Negro people are better looking than whites. Take the colored women, for instance. They are much more beautiful, judging them by every physical measure that might be applied. They are better form and better carriage and full of life and female vanity. Bridge complexion led to one of his only put one and only public speech engagement. At a street rally of Garvey's, Briggs is called the white man passing for black. Irate, he rushed from the audience and forgetting his speech impediment and delivering an impassioned three hour speech. From the first time the ABA drew blacks from socialist views who recognized the mass appeal of the Garvey of Garvey and his national rhetoric. One of these was Richard B. Moore, who worked with Garvey and Garvey, I also Bruce John Bruce as American agent of Deuce Muhammad's African Times and Orient Review. Brotherhood members who worked with the UNI include J. Ralph Kashmir, the West Indian poet and UNI organizer, W. A. Domingo, the editor of the Negro World, 
Edward Gray, who became the first officer in the UNIA Black Star Steamship and the biggest of one of many Garvey's commercial adventures, and Ben Burrell, who wrote the libretto of the first official Garvey anthem. Hubert Harrison, the Negro World assistant and editor, worked closely with the ABA, although he was never openly a member. Harrison and Briggs were friends for many years, with, Briggs helping, with Harrison helping Briggs on the Colored American Review, and Briggs working with Harrison on the Afro-American Liberty Party. The Brotherhood actually attempted to use the UNIA for its worldwide federation for a time. In April, in April 1920, the Crusader Briggs deemed the criticism of Garvey movement as friendly and constructive rather destructive and malice. He suggested how the UNIA might be better prepared for the forthcoming adventure. ABB members contribute to the development of Garveyism as individuals and indirectly through the writings of Briggs and other Crusaders. Briggs' race Catholicism cited earlier was an important statement for black nationalist principles. It called for a great sacrifice of life itself, if need be, and not in the name of working class or humanity, but to attain for the race the greatness in arms, kermits, art, and the three combined without which neither is respected, honored, or secure. The 1918 and 1919 Negro Yearbook Almanac reprinted the Catholicism for those unfamiliar with it. The ABB helped intensify the revolutionary militancy in the UNIA, which in turn helped the Brotherhood maintain a national position, although Briggs denies Garvey's influence. As he moves closer to the organization, organized left, the Brotherhood leader jeopardizes his place as a spokesman for black nationalism. But late in November 1919, he can still argue sympathetically with the numerous national ideas, including immigration. Existing as we are in this hell on earth where mob murders, church, court injustice, equality, inequality, and rank is widespread prejudice of the rule. It should be comparably easy on a matter of an American Negro in particular to pull up his stakes from this hellish soil of American mob proxy. Briggs forced the resignation from the Amsterdam News coincided with the Bolshevik Revolution, which he soon take the ideological guidance from. He wrote in a letter and he was not inspired by Garveyism nor engineering socialism per se. My sympathies would arrive from the enlightened attitude of the Russian Bolsheviks towards national minorities. I believe then and still believe that the Russian communists have successfully solved the national question. Briggs is not troubled by the USSR failure to fulfill Lenin's plan of an autonomous ethnic and national grouping. That self-determination was proposed at all was sufficient. Briggs wrote histor historian Theodore Draper, I was never a member of the Socialist Party. I ne did not consider the Socialist Party interested in the imperialism struggle or offering me anything in particular. I wasn't in the messenger crowd. My interest in communism was a national liberation struggle nor economic struggle. In the 1919 Crusader, Briggs defined his policy as Negro first, but if to fight one rights to be Bolshevik, then we are Bolsheviks and let us make the most of it. And further information of the asses who loosely lose the turn today. We will make the statement that we will not for a moment hesitate to ally ourselves with any group. If by such alliance we can amass liberation for our race and a redemption of our fatherland. A man pressed on earth by another with murderous intent is under any obligation to choose his weapon. He will be a fool if he did not use any or whatever weapon within his reach. Self-preservation is the first law of human nature. Briggs believed through, believed through revolution was necessary for genuine black liberation. He had no patience with Rudolph, with Randolph, and other moderate blacks who were proud for their reasonable goals and methods. And a rancor denounced one crusader reader who agreed with the brotherhood goals but suggested, our cause is just and righteous, but I'm sure it could be one in a nice, easy way. Briggs began in rudimentary race, race consciousness and eventually concluded all liberation struggles should support this aid and self-preservation of the black race. This shift in thinking is delineated to two articles on the Mexican Revolution, one in the Colored American Review of 1915, the second in the 1919 Crusader. In the former, a particularly gruesome lynch lynching in Georgia, prompted Briggs to describe the state of rivaling Mexico and its turbulence, and then he equated the struggling Mexicans with both the Georgias and the cultural barity of Germany. Four years later, he was deriding American intervention in Mexico chasing Pancho Villa. What is this, asked Briggs? Americans are trying to preserve law and order in Mexico? The mob ruling the United States will make the law and order in Mexico? 
The barbarous and benign U.S. raids in the land of people who, by all indications, seem quite able to live together without engaging in race war and mob violence and Phoenix torture of human beings, which is so freely and hardly indulged on this side of the Rio Grande, and which is more than anything a contemporary American history of assailing and identifying features of much broader American civilization. Briggs saw the attempt, the invasion of Mexico to attempt to see Mexican oil and mineral wealth by American capitalists and their junkers who could justify the action because Mexico was peopled by a colored race whose independent white Americans saw no reason to respect. Garvey endorsed many of the national liberation struggle, but he did not advocate for coalition with these people, nor did he lend in thinking influence his views on determination. Since the Brotherhood was never designed as a mass organization, it can function accordingly to its plan only by joining a larger body. The groups attempt to work out such a contract with the UNIA, but Briggs, but when Briggs wrote Garvey in 1921 to ask for recognition and cooperation, his letter went unanswered. By this time, there were few ABB members left in the UNIA. Domingo had been dismissed from the Negro world for a socialist and ally leanings, and an ABB member on the Black Star Line staff had lasted only a few months. And Hubert Harrison, the ABB strongest leader to the UNIA, was soon to lead the Negro world. In short, a split between the left and black nationals was coming to the open. Such a difference was less sharp in the Caribbean. A Trinidad UNIA president reported to the Crusader as late as November 1921 that the UNIA and the ABB were jointly struggling for survival in this country. And he added, while admiring Garvey M. Briggs, their respective publication, we must also remember others who are doing much for the race in some or other way. Negroes in Africa know the Honorable Casey Hayford and others. Those in America know Ferris, Easton, and others. Too numerous to mention. Those in England know Aduce Muhammad Ali. For the Trinidad UNIA chief, Briggs was still qualified for a who's who in black nationalism. Briggs in the Brotherhood became personal non grata with the Garviates in the United States after the disturbing episode of 1921 UNIA convention, which received no response to the question of reliance at the ABE for the convention. Copies of the ABE ABB program was passed out and extinguished to his group and moderates on the left. Briggs arranged for a white communist anarchist past the roads to speak. The fire in Mrs. Stokes exhorted the Bolshevik revolution from work for minorities and asked the convention to endorse the international communist movement. Brotherhood supporters and audience put forth a motion to that effect, which entabled after the lengthy and the bitter debate. The ABB question raised again at a later session, this time by opponents who put through the resolution dispelling the Brotherhood from the UNIA with Garvey's blessing. Unofficial cooperation was now replaced, with, uh, replaced by official separation. Garvey had sought to oust the Brotherhood because his members were dangerous Bolsheviks and he, as he turned them. Ironically, the same summer, Du Bois Pan-African Congress called Marcus Garvey a Bolshevik, the currents cannot turn for extremists often using no reference to communism. In Briggs' account, Gary felt it was necessary to prevent them from officially presenting in consideration of the delegates program formulated by the ABB because he saw the program gain favors in the eyes of most of the delegates who had given careful consideration to the printed forms distributed by the ABB. Although the ABB was unquestionably communistic, it had no organizational ties to international communism. It was finally at least a year and a half before the Workers' Party and the Communist Party of the United States. A handful of key brothers did, brotherhood leaders did join the Communist Party by 1925, but few, if any, of lesser leaders or rank and file members followed them. The African Blood Brotherhood was never affiliated with the Workers' Party, Briggs wrote in 1961, adding, Leading members of our executive or Supreme Council had joined the Workers' Party, but the ABB had retained its organizational independence. The Communist Party only had 24 black members in 1927, and half of them had joined between 1925 and 1927 without participating in the ABB. In other words, less than a dozen of ABB, nearly 3,000 members in the United States joined the CP. Though the white political group can often have often, although the white political groups can often control blacks groups through monetary contribution, the comparatively impoverished CP was in no position to buy off the ABB. A few true leaders, a few leaders of the Communist Party ties might have dictated policy organization as centralized and disciplined structure. As the ABE, at least one ABE leader, Domingo, renamed as a socialist. Further, the Communists not only had no Negro policy to dictate, but in the ABE early years, the two rival Communist Party existed, 
along with industrial workers of the world, which had won support from many regular revolutionaries, including Briggs. Thus, the communist policy of the African Blood Brotherhood was its own doing. Garvey broke with the ABB then because the ABB extremism, not because of white Communist Party influence. Without a coalition, the Brotherhood was doomed, although it survived until the late 20s. Yet Garvey also lost, as the ABB will provide a most useful wedge in the UNIA fight with its black American opposition. With a militant left-wing organization, the UNIA could have exposed the conservatism of Randolph Du Bois and others. But the Brotherhood left Garvey with no choice. It won a revolution now. At the 1921 convention, Garvey talked about the day when Japan would lead Asia against Europe in the Second World War, and the blacks would refuse to fight along the sides of white men. Unimpressed, Briggs scored Garvey for failing to state that simply, in the event of war between the United States and Japan, the American Negroes should form a Japanese anti-American society. Briggs often threw caution in the wind. Writing on the Ku Klux Klan in 1921, he, de he declared, it's a war, it's a war of, of the cracker element of the white race against the entire Negro race. Whether the Negro race meet the issue courageously, demonstrating its essential humanity, or in cowardly surrender to the enemy, it will be a war just the same, a war against the Negro race. Where other, other elements of the white race will eventually be drawn to the cracker onslaught against our rights and lives remain to be seen. History indicates its likely, extreme likelihood. Their only certainties are one, that it's war, two, that the white government in the United States will take no effective steps to protect our rights, Three, the white North and the so-called white friends will continue to be empathetic to our, un do our wrongs and at best maintain our belligerent neutrality. Certainly not the murders of a man who sought out to white liberals. Perhaps the history should honor Briggs for his nerve. Yet, while there is no compromise in the truth, yet while there was no compromising with the truth, there could surely be attack when it comes to the strategy. The Brotherhood also faced internal difficulties. Domingo, for example, saw the Brother ABB as a means of spewing huge hatred at Garvey, his former boss and boyhood friend. Otto Henswood, the only Brotherhood leader who, met, who first joined the Communist Party, held strong hopes of radicalizing white workers in contrast to Briggs' skepticism. Hurstwood helped shift the, B A the B A B B from nationalism towards that part of his program, which said the class conscious white workers have, who have spoken in favor of African liberation and had the willingness to back with action their expressed sentiments must be considered as actual allies. The non-class conscious white workers who have not to yet realized that all workers, regardless of race or color, have common interests must be considered as potential allies. The program also called for an alliance with Russia, not on the merits or the merits of the Soviet Union form of government, but on the outstanding fact that Soviet Russia was opposing to the imperialism robbers who partitioned our motherland and subjugated our country. The ambiguities and radicalism of the ABB prompted Garvey to commit communism among Negroes in 1920-21 was represented in New York by such Negroes as Cyril Briggs and W.A. Domingo. And my contact and experience with them and their methods are enough to keep me shy from that kind of communism for the balance of my natural life. A group of men of any ism or party who will seek to kill or legally or improperly dispose of a political adversary are no associates for those who seek perfection of government. The American Negro is warned to keep away from communism as it is taught in this country. He should work, watch, wait for his opportunity, which is largely of his own doing. During 1922 and 1923, the ABB fought Garvey hard while trying to build a new federation among black liberals and leftists. Its efforts accumulated in a large meeting in New York called the San Hatred, which quickly degenerated into a shouting match between martyrs and radicals. By 1924, Briggs was trying to make amends with Garvey. Posing as a white man, he secretly purchased a ship for the UNIA through a stock, his shipbroker friend, Anthony Crawford. But Briggs lost any chance of reproachment later that same year when the Brotherhood members who had infiltrated the UNIA convention was rebuffed for their demands of a declaration of war on the Ku Klux Klan. Briggs then returned completely to the CP, officially leaving the ABB in 1925. Although he continued to handle some routine work, Harry Haywood, a compatriot of Briggs and a World War I veteran who found Garvey to reformance, said the leaders dropped out of ABB because it was wrong to think 12 million Negroes could attain freedom on their own when there was such a minority in the nation as a whole. The Brotherhood 
itself was now dead for nearly a half a century. But the contemporary black revolutionaries have African, Asian, and Latin, Latin American models, while Briggs and his followers only had the Soviet Union as a convincing example of successful social revolution. This is cure the valid revolutionary aspects of Garyism, which the African Brotherhood helped to create. So, you know, hey, that's what it is. Sign to the scribe to the page. More love to the Honorable Ancestor Cyril Briggs. Much love to the Ancestor Cyril Briggs. Subscribe to the page. Peace.